Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second of many virtual calls uh, put forth by Cargill. My name is Ames Leslie. I am an account rep for Cargill out of North Balfour, Saskatchewan. So I'll welcome you on this this uh, day of, of potential storms. So please, if, if you need to travel anywhere today, please check the weather. As many areas are already seeing rain and there is some inclement weather coming afterwards. But wouldn't that be typical for what would normally be crop production week when generally we have the coldest weather of the year? Um, we have a nice week, but now we have some inclement weather. So definitely welcome. Thank you for taking the time to be part of this uh, virtual platform. Do realize it is new for many, many people, um, but I think we are all in store for some great things today. Um, thank you, Katie, for the wonderful music to, to bridge the gap before we got started. So a few things, um, just a little housekeeping before we get started and introduce everybody that you will um, hear from today. Please mute your lines. If you don't know where that is, up in the top right corner, there's a little bit of microphone um, icon. If there is not a line through it, please click on that now so it shows a line through it. Um, we are an open forum, so at any point if you have any questions, um, just unmute yourself and, and uh, um, ask your question or there is a hand um, at the top where you can raise your hand um, and somebody, uh, one of our moderators will, will grab you. And the thirdly, there is a little bit of a text um, section. Use this as often as you want and as, as many times as you want to ask questions or even um, pose statements um, as we will talk through um, a little bit of uh, fertilizer and as well as um, able to um, talk through some markets here. So, um, once again, welcome everybody. Do a quick introduction. Um, first, we'll, we have Katie uh, Kattenbach. She is a market development agronomist with, with Cargill. She is based out of North Battleford um, in the Scott area of Saskatchewan. We also have Ryan Mollenbeck. He is uh, an agronomist, a market development agronomist as well. He is covering the Kindersley Rose Town areas. And as well as we have um, Ed Brzezinski. Um, he is a grain marketing advisor, a uh, senior advisor. In Cargill here, and we will get to that right away. Um, if you want to throw up the agenda here for me uh, quickly, Janina. So this is kind of the agenda we'll look at. Is is you know we're going to touch base on on some of that foliar for, uh, fertilization as well as some fungicides. Uh, we'll we'll touch base on some plant growth regulators. Then we will go into some of the marketing side, why these are important. Uh, protein spreads, uh, what the outlook may be on wheat and durum for this remaining year, uh, what's important to watch out for to maybe trigger higher prices, as well as, as kind of what the outlook would be going into harvest of next year. So, um, and by all means, we'll look at uh, questions and, and comments from anybody. Um, so with that, uh, just uh, want to say, um, there is going to be more sessions throughout this week and every time you do register there is a potential you can win $250 gift card by registering so please take in as many of these can as you can um, and uh, we'll turn it over to Ryan I believe is, is starting us off. Thank you everybody, hopefully you enjoy. Okay good morning everyone uh, as Ames said I'm Ryan Mullenbeck market development agronomist out of uh, the Rose Town Kindersley area uh, and I'm just gonna start off our session here just talking a little bit about uh, fertility and um, you know getting your crop off to a good start and how this can uh, play on, play into um, higher crop quality and also uh, protein levels so obviously we want to get uh, the best start to a crop the better the better our crop is starting off the the better it'll be throughout the year um, and uh, seed treatments are one of the things that we can definitely do um, to help protect your crop regardless of what the moisture conditions or or the environment is doing um, it's one of those things that uh, i like to say is it's control control the controllables and um, you know there's a lot of things that we aren't in our control and anything we can do to mitigate that to ensure that we are um, handling the things that we can control the better off we are and so one of those things is a seed treatment i think they do show their value regardless of um, like i said whether it's a dry year or a wet year um, there is still disease in the soil that uh, certain diseases prefer different um, conditions and i would recommend a seed treatment every year um, whether you use uh, bin run seed or um, certified seed i think uh, you know maybe we should just take into account that you know bin run isn't uh, a free 
free input. It does uh, have a cost to it, as you're all well aware of, uh, you know, trucking and cleaning and things like that. So, um, you know, maybe uh, certified seed is something that you got to look at. Get a newer okay, variety. Um, maybe it's working better Josie's uh, negative. for your operation. Okay, limbs. Come here. So uh, I'll tell you know, exactly. Someone needs to mute picture. themselves, Ryan. Someone needs to mute themselves. Be pause and. Yeah, no, Sherry, we'll take care of that. We'll mute people if we catch them. So we'll let Ryan keep going. Okay, so. Um, and if you do re re reuse your seed, again, uh, uh, something that we, we recommend is that uh, you do test it every year um, i know we had some pretty good conditions going into harvest and you may be tempted not to test your seed but i would always recommend um, not only a germination test but also a full um, fungal scan um, and something you can do as well um, that some guys aren't aware of is you can get them to test it with your preferred seed treatment to see how that'll perform out in the field uh, especially in a year you know, that's a, a valuable tool, you know, where we did maybe have some poor harvest conditions and you're maybe not so sure on the, the quality of the seed, get it tested with a seed treatment and then you can see kind of what the results are going to be for you when you're actually out there putting it in the ground. Um, and lastly, the, the most important thing that often gets ignored on a seed test as well is the thousand kernel weight. Um, this is a very valuable tool um, and um, what it allows you to do is to, instead of just saying, I'm going to put two bushels down, I'm going to, you know, put, you know, uh, just the generic kind of seeding rate. It allows you to, to change your thinking to more of a plant population. And I know we've kind of gotten there with a lot of the canola seeds um, with some of the way it's being packaged and, and uh, sold now. Um, but very highly recommended that you target a 25 to 30 plants per square foot um, as well with um, with your wheat and durum and barley and other crops um, and that thousand kernel weight is going to help you do that that's really the only way to dial in that seeding rate and again it'll help you you know control some of your costs it'll help you control your plant population help you control evenness and uh, uh, emergence of the crop and that'll just tie into you know better results all the way down the line throughout the year um, so uh, those are some things that uh, you know we recommend to to get the crop going to to make sure that you're you're getting it off to a good start, um, and then when it comes to specifically you know more quality and, and protein issues that uh, we see that often comes down to um, to fertility, um, and I'll get to that, but I just wanted to quickly touch on fungicides, I guess while while we're kind of Ryan. talking about. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I just interject? Just the, yeah. on the on the premise of the seed treatments, um, mm -hmm. for those who have been trying to get into seed treatment for the last few years and maybe necessarily don't have the equipment or are not willing to to make the investment in the infrastructure, talk to your local crop and uh, Cargill crop input advisor, as Cargill is helping bridge that gap um, by doing some custom treating um, on farms. So if there is something that would interest you and help you know, to this information you're hearing, make it a little bit better and more efficient for you on your farm. Uh, reach out to your local Cargill rep and, and we can help bridge that gap for you. Yeah, for sure. And um, my other recommendation to that would be any equipment is better than nothing, uh, you know, even if it's incremental gains. Um, but good point. Um, and then there was a question, can TKW be done on oh. the farm? Um, yeah, you just count out as many kernels as you want and, and multiply. I used to do it quite a bit. I don't know if I'd I guess if it's a stormy day like it's supposed to be today, you can count out a thousand kernels and you know get a good scale. Um, you know, oftentimes even counting two hundred and fifty or five hundred is is uh, sufficient, and then you just you know multiply it out. So um, as long as you could, just like any seed test, have a good representative sample and uh, a good scale, and you should be you, you know you'll be right in the ballpark with doing it doing it at home as well. So I just don't like. Uh, just just make sure you have a good system <laughs> you don't want to start over when you get to to 239. um so again uh controlling the controllables um fungicides uh this is a real tough subject really depending upon uh where you're farming uh i grew up in the northeast around the humboldt area and you know fungicides on wheat is almost a given that you're going to do it uh now where i'm working out here uh you know in the kindersley rose town area it's got to be some you know pretty adverse conditions before guys start uh, considering uh, a fungicide on wheat. Um, and even on Durham, guys will maybe 
you know, it's it's July. Throw the sprayer in the slough and walk away and go to the lake. No one wants to keep spraying because it's been a, you know a long season. But um, you know we have that risk factor for fusarium and leaf disease that can that can downgrade our crop. Um, so again, what can we do to decrease that risk? Um, you know, variety selection, um, timing of seeding, nutrition is big, a, a big key. A healthy crop is going to be less susceptible to, to disease. Um, but also, you know, applying a fungicide is, is something that's uh, in the producer's control. Uh, I'm not an advocate of just going to spray to spray just to, to make yourself feel good or, or spend the money. Um, you know, that runs us into other issues like resistance and things like that. But, um, you know, I would definitely take that opportunity to, to not walk away uh, from that wheat and durum crop, even if it isn't looking like uh, a fusarium year. Um, I saw lots of fusarium and durum um, this fall, even though the conditions would have said it wasn't a year to spray. So take the time to either have your your uh, your rep um, scout for you or scout yourself. Um, it'll be an opportunity to, to look at the crop and say, hey, do we need to protect maybe for some leaf disease? Maybe the flag leaf isn't looking so great. Maybe this is an opportunity to top up with some foliar nutrition. Maybe this is the time to, you know, maybe there's a chance to look, you know, maybe it's a midge issue that we're going to be running into. So um, give the, give your wheat and durum the, the care and attention it deserves. Um, try out a fungicide if it's if it's kind of a dicey you know you're 50 50 on the fence definitely give it a shot to see you know on maybe some fields where you're going to be saving it for seed or some fields where it's looking really good um and uh, see how it works on your farm that's something that i advocate a lot is you know split some fields try some fields try try it out see how it works and then that way in the future you'll have experience from your own land and your own practices to to ground that decision so that you can make better decisions in the future Okay, so now we can roll into fertility, like I was saying. Um, this is going to be playing a big factor in, um, in a lot of our quality, our, our yield, especially as you're, as you're well aware of, and also protein issues. Um, so right now, you can get urea anywhere from, you know, 4 to $470 a ton. Um, wheat prices are, you know, from between 6 and $8, anywhere kind of in that range right now. Um, and it, when we're kind of at that cost of fertilizer and, and this price for, for spring wheat. The economics would, would tell us that 150 pounds total nitrogen between what we have in the soil at that 24 inch and what we're adding um, uh, for uh, your fertilizer or nitrogen fertilizer is going to maximize our yield. And uh, um, when we're talking protein, um, you know, we need to not only maximize your yield, but then we need to have nutrition left over in order to um, start making more protein. Um, and uh, the other thing we also need to have in place is um, a balanced approach to nutrition. So um, lots of nitrogen is, is key, but also the supporting players um, are important as well, especially when we're below that 13%, 13 and a half. Um, that's when a lot of the varieties start really uh, kind of topping out and you, you run into some much smaller incremental gains uh, as far as what fertility can do. But if we're below that that level, um, I feel that fertility is more important than, than what the weather conditions are going to do. So, um, you know, start out with a good plan. What's my yield goal? You know, if my yield, and, and based on that, what am I going to need to supply uh, for nitrogen and other, and phosphorus and sulfur and other nutrients in order to meet that yield goal? And then, what moisture did I get? Did I have the moisture available to meet that yield goal? What yield did I arrive at based upon the moisture that I that I got? And then what can I do next year in order to to make changes and, and move the needle again? Um, fertilizer, unfortunately, is kind of one of those things where a lot of guys, you know, tend to rely on what what we did last year and re rely on the same blends, rely on the same products. Um, but I think it's really an opportunity to say, okay, we got X amount of moisture last year. This is what I fed the crop. This is the yield I got. This is the quality I got. So how can I move the needle forward based upon, upon the things, again, that I can control? I can't control the weather. Um, and the weather last year isn't going to be the weather this year. So how can I plan for success? How can I make a plan and, and arrive to, to a goal that's profitable for me? Um, 
And some of those, again, those supporting players, um, you, you can think of nitrogen as like the fuel in the tank. Um, potassium is our, is our fuel pump that, that moves it. Um, in order to, to make things happen in the plant, we need energy, and that requires phosphorus in the form of, of ATP. Um, we need zinc for enzymes, energy production, um, proteins. Uh, Copper is going to play a role in, in photosynthesis, which is the, the powerhouse of the plant. It's very essential for pollination in, in cereals. And then we come to, to sulfur, which is uh, essential for the, uh, the formation of certain amino acids and proteins. Um, it's going to aid in seed production and uh, chlorophyll, uh, which is uh, without chlorophyll, we don't have photosynthesis and without photosynthesis, we don't have our plants. So sulfur at the at the proper place and ratio to nitrogen is uh, something that will help improve your crop. Um, you know, again, something that maybe gets left out of uh, a lot of uh, wheat and durum blends is is the sulfur. And we really want to target either a 10 to 1 to a 7 to 1 ratio of nitrogen to sulfur. Um, and this is going to help uh, meet our yield goals and, um, and and help move that protein um, move that protein higher. Um, one product that I like to use is Amidas. Um, it's an all-in-one fertilizer, one pearl that has 40.005, so it's got urea and AMS in that um, seven to one ratio. Um, and it's the combination of these two nutrients in one pearl at one feeding site for the plant that really helps improve um, nitrogen use efficiency so you're getting more bang for your buck um, it's much easier to handle lower dust and also um, it uh, helps improve yield and and maintain protein in a way that um, blends just can't um, so i've seen some some field scale trials where the the protein went up or the sorry the yield was increased with amidas and they maintain the protein level which is something that doesn't always happen because we get that yield dilution factor so um i just wanted to wrap up with one last uh tidbit on on nitrogen um and when it comes to weather conditions and adverse conditions and and planning for the future so you, you know uh i guess when we come through really dry conditions like we did last year um you know often the 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 thinking is maybe to to pull back a bit and again you know relying on what happened last year to maybe influence what's what's happening this year um but i found a long-term study that was done by a canada and in in 2009 they planted uh either peas lentils canola barley or or faba beans and then in 2010 they moved to a, a, a canola crop followed by barley and then canola again so three years of, of barley or uh, canola barley canola and in those years they fertilized anywhere from zero pounds per acre to 105 pounds of nitrogen per acre in 2013 uh, the next year they switched to wheat and then in the last year they switched to canola and so what they were trying to find out was like is that crop in 2009 you know that lentil crop or faba bean crop or, or wheat crop in 2009 it does that have a, an effect you know five years down the road they found that it doesn't but what they did find was that fertilizer that was applied in that uh that wheat canola or canola wheat canola year in uh previous to that that nitrogen rate had an effect on the next two years when they weren't applying any fertilizer so long story short um, the, the key takeaway is that whenever we're, we're talking about nitrogen and we're, you know, we put 150 pounds down, we put 160 pounds down, we really push the needle, maybe move our rates higher than we're used to. Um, and let's say it's a wreck, you know, we get a 30 bushel crop, things didn't work out. That nitrogen isn't lost. That nitrogen will be in the soil available for crops in 2020, in 2022 and 2023. So what we're doing now, as far as nitrogen is going to be around, it's, yeah, it's a sunk cost, it's in the soil, but it is in the soil and it will be available for you uh, down the road and it will have an effect on how your crops down the road will perform. So just something to keep in mind when you're, when you're making those decisions on fertility that, um, you know, if things do go wrong, um, that nitrogen isn't lost, that nitrogen will still be there for you and uh, available to, to make a difference in crops um, in the next two years. So that's all I have. Um, are there any questions?
Uh, is that on H32? Yeah, it's the the form of the nitrogen wasn't. Uh, I believe they used urea just because that's what they had um, available. But uh, the form of the nitrogen uh, wouldn't have an effect. It'll it'll be there, um, stored up in, in in the soil in the organic matter and in the available nitrogen. I think we uh, what about leaching? Well, there's no free lunch. There is going to be some leaching. Um, uh, you know, that's uh, un luckily we don't live in Illinois where they get four inches of rain at a time. I mean, I know that does happen for some guys, maybe in, in Hudson Bay and, and places like that. It's not out of the question, but yes, there will be some leaching, but. In Again, um, something that we can't control and something that we can't really uh, measure for. But I would say the the takeaway is don't uh, wor worry less about you know maybe the crop not working out because you put more nitrogen down and and again plan for success. Like we know we know that if you want to get a seventy bushel you, uh, seventy bushel wheat crop and thirteen and a half protein. It, it takes more than you know 120 pounds of actual land. It's going to take quite a bit more than that. So, if that's what it, if that's what we're shooting for, you know, then then we need to fertilize for it. And if it's a wreck, you know, make sure we soil test and know and know that that there will be nitrogen left over in 2022 and 2023. Um, and then is Amidas a foliar? No, Amidas is a granular product. Um, it, it was developed in Europe um, for the mainly for the spreading market. It's got like a really hard prill. It spreads really well. Um, but a lot of the uses that we see obviously here in Western Canada is going down the mid row or, or the side band um, and uh, used as your, your primary nitrogen source. You know, it, you know, you put it down at, uh, you know, 100, 150 pounds and, um, and you're getting, you know, 60 to, to 80 pounds of nitrogen and sufficient sulfur to go with it. Ryan, we uh, Glenn has his hand up for a question. Glenn, did you have a question? Is there any studies done on how long it takes for the micronutrients uh, and soil testing to build up in your soil over a five-year period? Um, offhand, I don't know of anything quite that specific. Um, but as far as building up, uh, as far as building up anything in the soil, it is better to start now before you have a problem um, with a lot of nutrients. There's kind of like, you know, we're, we're coming along, sloping down, sloping down, and then we kind of just fall off a cliff and it gets really, really hard um, to start building stuff up again. So, um, yeah. The, would the best answer would be, or go ahead, well. sorry. I would say it really depends on the nutrient that you're looking at too. Some mo some nutrients are mobile in the soil, like boron, for example, and so it's really you know a lot more difficult to to build boron up in the in the soil, depending on how much rain you get per year, than it is to build up, for example, copper, which is very immobile in the soil. So it is going to be dependent on the nutrient as well. Um, and then there was another question: sideband or mid row band for uh, nitrogen? Um, I guess that depends upon whether you work for for uh, Borgo or Seedhawk would be the answer to that question. Um, I, I don't, personally, I don't think there's a argument for or against either. Um, as long as you got some way to separate it in the soil um, and it is a machine that is working for you and uh, I, there's many roads to roam. I don't, I don't know if there is any difference between a side, side band or a mid row band as far as uh nitrogen placement i think both both will suffice um as long as you got some you know make sure your shovels are in good condition make sure you're you're getting a good trench and and good uh you know good packing force and good uh, separation between the fertilizer and the seed and after that then we can argue about paint I think we should maybe keep moving for the sake of time. Uh, we're gonna, I'm, I'm worried that we'll run up against the time constraint, but there will be more options for questions, um, I think at the end of the presentation as well. And we'll try to be answering some of them um, in the chat too. So Ryan, if, if that's good with you, I think we'll move on. Yep. Wonderful. 
Thank you so much for that. That was awesome. Um, I'm Katie Kettenbaugh. I'm the market development agronomist for Unity in North Battleford. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about foliar fertilizers and plant growth regulators. Um, I am going to go through some of this stuff fairly quickly, um, but the presentation is being recorded and will be available after the fact if you want to review any of the charts or um, things that I put up here. Um, yeah, and please, again, feel feel free to ask questions. We'll, uh, we'll take more questions at the end of the presentation as well. Um, so every year the market development team does uh, trials across the Saskatchewan. We're not doing, um, you know, scientific replicated trials necessarily, but uh, it is good for us to get kind of a feel of the, the products that we're working with. So this is a trial that uh, Michelle Thompson, our, um, our agronomist out of Valcaris, did uh, last summer. And I thought it was worth having a look at. Um, the big takeaway, in my opinion, from this is that uh, in crops where the untreated protein was lower, so at Foam Lake we've got 12.7 and in Abernathy it was 11.4 versus Defoe, which started at a, a protein of 13.4, um, we can see that by doing a foliar application in this case, we got a much more significant increase um, in protein the lower the um, sort of starting protein was. So it's really, uh, I think, important to be sort of realistic about what foliar um, products potentially can sort of do for you. And if you look at the bottom um, of the chart as well, it says the, the products that um, that these were sprayed with. So this was all done at, at head timing. Um, so that's a relatively late application of nitrogen. Um, so we are definitely seeing a response and this lines up with a lot of the, um, you know, the research that is kind of ongoing into timing of nitrogen applications. You know, as, as Ryan said, uh, a phrase that he used that I really like is that there are many roads to Rome. And so, you know, similar kind of idea here. There are a lot of ways to um, to feed your crop a later nitrogen application. Foliar isn't the only option. You could do it by, for example, including ESN in your blend um, or things like that. But uh, there are lots of really great foliar um, options as well. So if you're looking to increase protein, Assuming that you've already addressed, um, you know, your overall nutrition, then a foliar application can be a nice addition on top of a really good um, uh, fertilizer package already. We don't necessarily want to approach foliar nutrition with the idea of, well, I'll just roll back my main blend and top it up with the foliar nutrition. In my opinion, that's um, a little bit self self defeating because um, often you need that nutrition a little bit earlier, and then often there can be uh, things that that happen that mean that you don't get out to do the foliar application. So I would strongly recommend looking at any foliar application that you're doing as a, a top up or an addition or kind of the icing on a cake. Um, and hopefully that cake is already you know has a good amount of of nutrition in it. I'll uh, we'll go to the next slide, please, Gina. I wanted to discuss lodging um, a little bit as well because it really can have such severe uh, impacts on on quality. Um, so I'm sure that the effects of lodging probably aren't uh, uh, aren't new to anybody that's on this call. Uh, but just super briefly, when the crop's lodged, it's not using uh, nutrients efficiently. It can stay green for a long time, which means it can be more subject to um, frost damage. It can be hard to pick up. Um, and, act, and there can be more disease um, that happens in the canopy when it's when it's sort of folded over itself and the air isn't able to flow through it. So when we're thinking about lodging, um, it might kind of feel like something that's out of our control. And granted, you know, lodging that happens because of strong winds or if, if heaven forbid, I mean, I'm far enough, enough north that every now and then we get a snow while the crop is still in the field. So obviously there's nothing that nutrition can do um, to help that. But in order to uh, do everything that we can to avoid lodging, keeping an eye on the nitrogen levels and making sure that they're not um, sort of out of balance with the rest of the nutrients that are in the um, in the profile. So sometimes growers will think that in order to pursue protein, we'll just crank that nitrogen level way up. And that's often where we end up seeing a lot of lodging. Um, so making sure that you've got a balanced nutrient um, profile. And then also having a look at um, potassium and copper rates Potassium tends to be in fairly high amounts in our soils in Saskatchewan, so we don't typically think of it as being um, anything that's deficient. However, if you uh, you know are are experiencing problems with lodging over and over, I'd recommend trying a little bit of potassium, even say 15 pounds, um, 15 to 25 pounds of potassium in your cereal blend, um, and see if that potentially helps out with the lodging because potassium can be tied up by a few different soil factors. So um, it's definitely something that's worth. 
um, that's worth checking out. Sorry, I saw a question in the chat. I'm just going to have a look. Can copper yes, um, just with my ergot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely can. Um, and part of the reason for that is that copper has to do with pollen tube development. And so when a plant is deficient in copper, the um, the florets tend to stay open longer. And so they are more likely to get an infection just, just because they're open longer. So with adequate copper, um, the, the pollination happens faster. Those florets can close back down more quickly. And so, yeah, you're less likely to get an ergot um, infection. That being said, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to guarantee that you won't get any ergot, um, but it can definitely can definitely help with that. So, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So once we've addressed potential nutritional causes of um, of lodging, there are a few other options that we can do. Um, Modus and manipulator are plant growth regulators. They're well, I was going to say they're new to the market, but manipulators have been around for quite a while. Um, there were concerns with MRLs for um, the last little bit. Those recently have been all um, cleared up. And I think the grain team can maybe speak to that a little bit more as well. But um, yeah, so these these products are both um, available for use um, on the market right now, not on malt barley. That's something important to, uh, to know. For this presentation, I'm going to focus on Manipulator. If you're interested in hearing more about Modus um, on Friday's uh, Barley presentation, they're going to talk a little bit more about Modus. Um, but essentially, they do a very similar thing. Um, they are different molecules, but the, the action of the molecules in the plant is very similar. They will have different effects on different, um, on different varieties, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, but overall, the, uh, the effect in the plant is the same. Um, so, and that being the inhibition of gibberellic acid, which leads to a shorter plant with a thicker stem. Uh, next slide, please. Katie, we just have one more, one more question here. Um, what nitrogen product was mixed with fungicide in trial and melted urea? Question in mark. For that trial, we used a Yaravita product called Last N, um, which is formulated to be used as a foliar. Um, I know melted urea is used um, by some growers, absolutely. I would be cautious about that just, just because you have a, a higher likelihood of potentially getting a little bit of crop burn. It's a little bit harder to um, like measure and uh, kind of be very specific about the, um, uh, about the rates sometimes. And so I think that if you are doing a foliar ap application, and this doesn't necessarily go for top dressing. Top dressing, you're more intending to hit the soil whereas with a foliar application, you're intending to hit the foliage of the plant. Um, I would generally recommend using a, a product that is formulated for a foliar application. Um, often there will be slight changes in the, in the chemistry that make it easier for the plant to take that, um, that, that nitrogen through the leaves. You know, you can have results with, um, with melted urea, but again, I just would be really cautious about the, the crop burn piece on that as well. So. Yeah. Um, so on the manipulator, this is this is data from uh, manipulators website. So not not Cargill uh, independent data. This is Belgium's data. Um, but I wanted to put it up. The thing that I really want to point out with this um, is that they are definitely seeing differences um, among varieties. And I think that's something to really be aware of with anything that's working on um, sort of the hormone systems in the plant, which um, PGRs, plant growth regulators, are, are working on the hormone systems in the, in the plant. So um, we do tend to see a varietal effect, and it's not really sort of well documented yet, you know, exactly what each, how, how each variety is going to respond. So it's just really something to be aware of. Um, if it's something that you're really wanting to look into, I'd recommend, you know, check out Belgium's website, um, some of the more common varieties, I've got some view field results um, coming up here that I'll show you guys, um, they, they will have results on them. So if it's something that you're really interested in looking at, maybe have a look at the variety that you're growing and just see if there's some, some results um, available for that particular variety because there can be quite a strong variety effect. The other thing that I'd like to point out um, with their data here, they sort of talk quite a bit about um, the effect on yield. Personally, I wouldn't position this as a yield increasing product. Some of the some of the yield increase, in my opinion, could have been due to the fact that because the crop wasn't lodged, it's easier to pick up. Um, and so more of it or, you know, you're able to get it in a little bit earlier. I wouldn't necessarily say that having a shorter plant is going to um, increase your yield. So I just think that that's something to be aware of when you're 
when you're thinking about this. This, in my mind, is a harvest aid sort of um, harvest, you know, ease of harvest um, product and not necessarily a, a big yield builder. Um, yeah, can we do the next slide, please? So these are some results that I saw personally um, last summer. This was on Viewfield, and uh, yeah, the growers were really happy. As you can see, there was um, quite a difference. They kind of left a, a trial strip, and uh, the second picture, I know it's maybe a little bit difficult to see, but these were right beside each other in the field, and you could you could really see quite a difference. They didn't end up having any lodging in that field, um, and I think the yields were very similar there. So in this case, um, you know, was there a big ROI? Not necessarily. Did the product do what it was supposed to? Absolutely. Um, so picking a field where um, where you maybe had a lot of lodging before, or I guess just um, kind of putting, uh, putting this product in the right field is really critical as far as getting an ROI from it. Um, yeah, but I think it's it's really uh, a product that's, that's yeah. worth looking into, especially if you are someone that's been dealing with with a lot of lodging. So, uh, I think I had one more slide on the timing of the application. Yeah, um, and as I said, this, these slides will be available later. Generally, there is a very wide window of application. I would say the the ideal time would kind of be between the first node and flag leaf. Um, and unless you're doing sort of like a, a maybe a later herbicide application, there's not really usually a lot. That's kind of the time that a lot of guys like to go to the lake. Um, so of course, it seems like every time we add something new, uh, it, it fits into a spot that we don't already have an application down. Um, but as you'll see, there is a wide window of application too, so you can still get um, an effective, you know, use of this product if you're outside of that kind of ideal application window, not necessarily having to do a separate pass. So. Um, yeah, and I think that is more or less it. Oh, I did just want to put a quick plug in and remind everyone to check out our new website. Um, CargillAg.ca got a, a rehaul recently, and there's lots of really great um, blogs on the agronomy side, also on the marketing side. Um, there's some really, really excellent information there. Anybody can log in. You don't need to have a you know an account or anything to log in. Um, and yeah, anybody can go and check that out. There's um, kind of like ar archives of um, blogs and information and videos and all kinds of good stuff. So if you haven't been there in a while, uh, it's definitely worth worth checking out again. Uh, I'll just take a few questions and then I think we'll, we'll move along. Uh, Katie, yeah. is, oh, you got it. Is manipulator recommended on shorter variety wheat? Well, I mean, I think you're kind of maybe doubling up there a little bit. I guess if you were seeing on your semi-dwarf wheat that you're still experiencing a lot of lodging, it would be an option. I would say a lot of those varieties um, tend to stand up pretty well. So, I mean, I guess the other component that I didn't really mention here too is like as a straw management piece, if if you're growing a semi-dwarf wheat and, and potentially using manipulator, um, like I think that's an option if you're really wanting <laughs> less straw to deal with. Um, I don't know though as far as like a yield response or uh, you know if, if you would have, I think you would have a lower return on investment by using it on a variety that's already quite short. That's my opinion. I don't have a lot of first-hand experience with that but that is that's what I would say kind of off the top of my head. I'll maybe just add Kira's there in case someone's listening on the phone and can't see. If you're using a short variety and you are still having lodging, you may want to look at potassium fertility. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Absolutely. And then copper might be another thing that comes up too, but I would start with potassium for sure. So we're still getting some more questions, but I think in the in the sake of time, if we can keep pushing through here, Katie, and, and we'll make sure to answer your your questions afterwards. Sounds great. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, uh, Katie. We will now turn it over to Ed. Uh, I see he has logged in and he will take us through some market updates on wheat and Durham. Thanks, Ames. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, you're good, Ed. Perfect. All right. So in the vein and in the theme of protein spreads, um, I wanted to talk about a lot of people might have questions about why is low protein wheat or feed wheat starting to, um, oh, 
in many cases, it's actually been the same price as even a lower protein milling wheat. Uh, this is the Kansas Minneapolis spread. So in green is Kansas wheat, which is what you'd find um, correlated with the CPS values that uh, quoted at your elevator. And then Minneapolis in the black, that's uh, your hard red spring wheat. And you can see over, this is a five year chart, over five years, there's been usually a, a fairly significant spread between the two uh, with a 211 protein, which is CPS wheat, typically trading at a discount to hard red spring, your higher protein wheat. If you look to the right hand side of the chart though, you see basically since October, Kansas, so the 211 protein has moved to almost no spread at all with Minneapolis wheat. And so that's part of the reason why uh, in the future side, there's there's really no difference now between 211 Kansas wheat and uh, Minneapolis wheat. And that's the reason why the protein spreads have narrowed in uh, so far. And, and you see feed wheat and low protein wheat trading at such uh, high values. Uh, one of the reasons for is in the next slide, uh, U.S. hard red winter, which is your Kansas. And, and again, that's correlated with CPS wheat. Um, the stocks, the ending stocks in the United States are actually at a five year low. Uh, so the United States has been doing a good job of reducing the supply of low protein wheat. Uh, moving on to the next slide, the spread between those two. So this is another chart uh, showing what we saw, the difference between 11 protein and 13 protein wheat. So that the spread between Kansas and Minneapolis. Uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, you can see that it's the spike in 2008, that, that big shooting higher where uh, the spread went to 650. That meant that during the, the droughts and the, the wheat rally in 2008, Minneapolis wheat, 13% protein wheat, was $6.50 more expensive than CPS wheat, 211 protein. So you can see that that's a pretty big difference in 2017 that was the the rally that we had uh, in Canada due to a drought here you saw that Minneapolis wheat high protein wheat went to a 250 premium uh, what I wanted to draw your attention to is the red line that is the average protein spread between 13 percent protein and 11 percent protein over the past 20 years so 50 cents that's what you tend to see difference between 11% protein and 13 or 25 cents per tenth. And moving on to the next slide, then we can see what that means for your farm. So assuming a 25%, 25 cents per point um, protein spread average over 20 years, if you're a farmer who typically grows 12% protein and you may want to boost that protein up so you decide to top dress and you know you've, you've set your fertility so that you're you're targeting 14% protein the best you can or you're, you're shooting for a much higher level. So if you achieve that goal and you gain two points of protein uh, through your fertility program at a 20 year average of 25 cents per point um, with an average yield of 50 bushels per acre you will realize a $25 an acre return uh, on average over 20 years. Now, some years it's going to be higher, some years it's going to be lower, but over 20 years, uh, gaining that protein will return you $25 per acre. So uh, my point here is that, uh, you know, the protein matters significantly over 20 years. Um, so that's the, that's the protein presentation. I have went through it quickly. Any questions out there or uh, anybody want to make a comment perhaps? Okay, moving along to the wheat and Durham outlook. Uh, let's move to the first slide there. So Canadian wheat production this year was quite significant. We are the second highest yield or second highest production in Canada in the last 20 years. Um, you can see now basically since 2015-16, Canadian wheat production, excluding Durham, has been on a steady uptrend. In the next slide, we are showing the same data just in a uh, chart form and it breaks it down to the different components of our wheat supply and ending stocks. 
So a lot of numbers on the chart. I want to draw your attention to the far right hand side of the screen, that column 2020 to 21 and go down about four lines and that's the yield. So you see a yield there, 55 bushels to the acre. That's the highest yield that we have had in Canada in five years. So of course, and then the the acreage this year is the second highest. So highest yield, second highest acreage, that's our record production right there. But if you go down to the bottom of the page uh, on the right hand side, our stocks to use, which is everything that's left over after we've used all the wheat for the year is 17%. So it's actually fairly manageable relative to the last five years. What's going on? About four lines up from that 17% is total exports. 20.1 million tons of exports. Going back in five years, that's a record number. We're exporting records amount of wheat out of Canada. So that's how we can manage to have a, a, a almost, almost record, a second highest record supply, but we can still manage to keep the price here in the $7 range, which tends to be a fairly good price for wheat. Moving on to the next slide, um, you can see world wheat ending stocks are a little bit more concerning. Uh, we are at far and away a record world ending stocks of wheat. And uh, a chart like this where you can see, uh, I'll draw your attention to the middle around 2007, 2008, where we saw you know quite low stocks of wheat. Um, and then we've seen just a massive increase in supplies. Moving on to the next chart, that's where you get a spring wheat chart that looks like this. Massive spike in 2008, and then, of course, you've got this massive or uh, long-term kind of, I don't want to say depressed, but just lackadaisical wheat market now since 2008. It's because we've, we've just, in the world, built so many uh, stocks of wheat. Of course, this is uh, something that we know, and this is something that the market is well aware of. So why is wheat rallying right now? Why did yesterday spring wheat jump almost 20 cents? In the next chart, I'm going to show you the corn wheat spread. So that's what's going on here. We can still have massive stocks of wheat in the world, but if corn is going to be doing the legwork, if corn is going to rally, then you can still manage to increase the wheat price. Corn, of course, is king. That's the saying as, as the saying goes. So we want to look at what's the incentive for the farmer to grow spring wheat versus corn in North and South Dakota, which is where most of the spring wheat is traded from. This is a 10-year uh, chart of the corn wheat spread. And so I'll draw your attention to 2013 on the left-hand side of the page. That, it, that means that um, spring wheat at that time was trading at 80 cents premium to corn. And the reason why was because in 2013 there was a, a drought across the U.S. corn growing areas. So corn was quite expensive. And, uh, and, and the, the premium for spring wheat was quite low. Of course, in 2017 then, kind of in the middle of your page, you can see that big spike in the chart. So $4 premium, that was spring wheat was at a $4 a bushel premium to corn during 2017, during the spring wheat drought. On the far left hand or right hand side of the page, you can see right now spring wheat is at a $1.20 premium to corn. That's actually at the low end of the 10 year range. And what that suggests is that um, spring wheat is undervalued relative to corn. Spring wheat is, is affordable or cheap. And so that's where you get the idea where if corn rallies, that spread needs to narrow. The average spread is about two bucks. So spring wheat can still rally, even though there's big stocks of wheat, if corn rallies because that spread needs to stay at, at, at right, on, right around an average range of around $2. So I think watch corn. It, what corn does, you can expect wheat to do as well. Uh, it may be not quite as aggressive as corn, but you can expect that with strong corn prices, wheat prices should stay at least supported. Um, moving on to Durham in the next slide, Canadian Durham wheat production is at the third highest uh, production levels since 2000. Uh, again, that's, you know, it seems like that should be bearish for the Durham wheat market, but
but we are seeing fairly strong prices. Uh, in the next slide, and my last slide, the supply and demand of Durham in Canada uh, is fairly tight. If you look at the very bottom right hand side, 10% stocks to use. So that means that uh, we've only got 10% of a crop left after we export and, and use it all for pasta here in Canada. Uh, if on the top side of this column, you see yield for Durham is at the second highest it's ever been. So very similar to spring wheat, you know, we've got big yields. Acres are the second highest they've been in the last five years. So we've got big yields, big acres, record production of Durham, or not a record production, sorry, but uh, a, a large production of Durham this year. Uh, the second highest it looks like in the last five years. What's going on? Again, near the bottom corner of your page, about four lines up from the very bottom, you see exports. Total exports, 5.5 million tons. A record export number for Durham out of Canada. That's the reason that you can have big supplies, uh, big yield, uh, but still keep the Durham supplies uh, relatively tight and keep the Durham prices uh, fairly stable. So I'm not really bullish Durham based on that. I mean, we've got a lot of Durham but I'm not bearish Durham because uh, we've got good exports. So that's why you can see this kind of stable supply right between eight and $9 uh, so far this year. Um, I think the general theme for the presentation is look at the spreads, look at corn, where corn goes. So will many of our other cereal grains uh, and also look at exports versus supply. Big supply, big exports gives us a market that is at a, a you know a fairly strong price, um, but doesn't necessarily mean we're going to go blowing to the upside. But it also means that we've got some support from good demand. So that's the theme of my presentation. If anybody has any questions or if we want to make some contents, uh, fire away. Wonderful. Well, uh, we're waiting for maybe some questions to, to come forth. You know, oh, we do have a hand up. Does anybody have an eye on who that is? Does uh, yeah. value per dollar affect? Usually it affects uh, the price of our grain. And this year it seems to be all over the board. Uh, any reason for that? I can take that. The Canadian dollar will affect the price of grain when there's not many other stories going. So when there's ample supplies, as there have been in maybe the past five years, then there's not a lot of other stories on the go. It's like, yeah, there's lots of grain, but, uh, you know, the demand is kind of so, so, you know, whatever the Canadian dollar is, that's that's our benefit. That's our um, differentiator with other countries as to what the, the price of our grain is going to be worth. When demand starts increasing, when corn goes to $5 and above, when you see soybeans at $14, you know, all of a sudden there's a different dynamic at play. So the Canadian dollar starts to drop in relative importance for grain prices. So you hit the nail on the head. It's all over the map. We can't always say that the Canadian dollar has the same effect on grain prices. What we can say, though, is that for wheat in particular, it will affect the basis because when you're selling wheat on the export markets, it's in U.S. dollars. And so that directly when you sell it in U.S. dollars, you directly have to pay the Canadian farmer in Canadian dollars. So there is a still a direct effect on wheat. But in the for the most part, if the demand is strong, then the price will be strong. And that's what we're seeing. So hope that it helps you. Awesome. Glenn, you I got your hand up for a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, that was his question. Oh, that was Glenn that asked yeah. that? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I got a follow-up question there. It's Matt here. Um, like, normally, kind of used to that Canadian dollar being lower helping our basis, which I understand. But right now, there's... Like it seems like the U.S. dollar being lower against all the global currencies is kind of making them more competitive. Like, which one of those is is a stronger factor going forward? Because kind of they work in opposite directions, kind of for our price, I'd say. Yeah, that's a good point. The Canadian dollar is going to affect wheat basis and sometimes affect canola futures because canola futures are priced in U.S. or Canadian dollars. 
So look at the Canadian dollar for Canadian dollar priced um, goods. So canola futures and cash price in your pocket at the elevators in Canadian dollars. U.S. dollar will have an effect on U.S. priced futures or if you're selling grain in U.S. dollars. And for that reason, when you see a weak U.S. dollar, it tends to support all commodities priced in U.S. dollars. And so that includes soybeans, that includes spring wheat futures, that includes corn futures. So a lower U.S. dollar is going to help the, the, the um, U.S. priced commodities increase U.S. competitiveness. And I would say you hit the nail on the head. That's the one that's really driving grain prices at this point. Uh, the Canadian dollar has fallen in relative importance. Okay. Wonderful. Great, great questions. A uh, couple quick things. Um, wheat, you know, definitely has not been the easiest year for when to pick the trigger that time. Um, I think in in relation to to canola, um, for example, I think there's more uh, wheat unpriced uh, on paper than uh, with wheat than there is canola. So, um, just a couple of quick things. If if anybody is wondering. What can I do to help make that decision or make that decision sooner as we're seeing elevators right across uh, Saskatchewan starting to fill up? Um, one product we quickly have, and, and, and please reach out to your grain buyers um, and your marketing as, as associates to, to learn more, is called a pacer. So very quick understanding of a pacer is if you were to take 100 ton of your wheat and spread it over a 100 day trade period, uh, the pacer would sell one ton per day at the close um, as an averaging um, across those 100 days. So a year like this, you know, when the market's been continually going up and up and up every day, it would have been an ability to start a pacer in, in September and October, deliver your grain and been able to, to capture the market long term. Um, another, another great product that maybe many people have done is pro pricing. So pro pricing is where uh, the Cargill merchandising team will trade your wheat that you commit to Cargill alongside the wheat they're trading of their own. Um, the ultimate goal is, is to um, utilize profit for both you, the farmer, and, and for Cargill while we trade this on a global um, perspective and use our global knowledge to trade your wheat. Um, the only thing that you as the, the farmer are responsible for is establishing your basis. You know, features plus basis uh, meets your, your deferred delivery contract. Um, so it, it, it takes away from having to watch the markets to try and determine when you need to pull that trigger. Um, for those customers out there that are potentially a little bit more um, feel like they, they would like to dabble in the risk side of the business a little bit of the trade side, we do have what's called a focal point. So a focal point is, is the ability to buy back on paper futures into you know wheat or canola um, and stay in the market when these markets continue to rise. You know why it's a little bit riskier is because it does have uh, downside risk um, that you're responsible for, but it does have um, you know unlimited upside. But we will work to put in targets both up and down um, to make sure that uh, the tool uh, meets the needs of each farm gate. So those are a few different options out there that a person can look at to, to help bridge that gap of making decisions. Um, you know, I thank everybody for for their time today. We're we're ultimately coming up to our our, our hour here, um, and we will um, open it up any more questions or um, comments here on wheat or Durham. Um, if not, uh, keep in mind tomorrow we are we are back on um, to capitalize on your pulse markets at 9 a.m. again. Um, so it'd be great presentation on on what the pulse market and, and some options there. And if you're a Twitter user, keep an eye out for the grains for grains hashtag. We've got some videos and stuff that are coming out um, over the week as well. Wonderful. Have a great uh, day, everybody. And, and remember, the weather may not be that great today, so just take your time and, and travel safely. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very Thank much. You.